Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Axon started out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. Imagine having 100 years of tire and wheel knowledge in your back pocket the next time you sell a piece of ag equipment. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. This podcast is also brought to you by Valley Transportation. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransinc.com for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is also brought to you by AgDirect. No matter how you buy your ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Moving Iron. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. Marcus with Sean Hackett. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Axon would like to give all the loyal listeners of the Moving Iron Podcast an Alliance pocket knife. Uh, if you're looking to get a nice pocket knife, go to marketing at axontire.com and Axon will send that to you for free. Just send your details, tell them you heard it on the Moving Iron podcast, and they'll drop in the mail and send it to you for absolutely free. So if you're looking, if you're looking for a new pocket knife, go to marketing at axontire.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800 657 4910 or go to Valley transinc.com for all your trucking needs at valley transportation our goal is to help you reach yours and no matter how you buy ag equipment from a dealer an auction or a private party ag direct can help you finance it you can even apply online at agdirect.com learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com sean hackett is with hackett financial out of boca raton florida and he's nice enough to come on a couple times a week to talk about what's happening in the market so sean how you doing this morning i'm doing pretty good casey pretty good Good man. Well, we got a shot of some moisture. Looks like coming across the uh, the plains here, central part of the United States. Uh, we had some snow over the weekend, and then we're going to get another shot here today. So, looks like we're uh, going to get a little taste of a thing called moisture. I don't know. I'm anxious yeah, to see what I, it looks I, like. I, it looks like it looks like there's going to be much more of a of a steady moisture pattern here for your area and the northern plains uh, for the rest of March. Um, you know, obviously uh, much needed yeah. and uh, much appreciated. So, it looks like that's going to start to kick in a little bit so to say the least yeah there's been uh, quite a bit of quite a bit of dryness out here um we've had the cold but not necessarily moisture so looking forward to uh, getting some moisture out of this so uh, like always if you ever have a question for sean just hit me up at uh, moving iron podcast moving iron podcast.com and i can get that over to you get that over to sean uh, we did have a uh question from a listener here sean you think you're up for a little pop quiz here um, if I get it right. All right on. See, there you go. That's the spirit. I like that. <laughs> All right. So Brad from Hurley, South Dakota. He's a listener of the podcast and listens to Sean uh, a lot. He subscribes to Sean's newsletter and, and those kind of things. So his question is, with the recent run-up in, in new crop corn price, is the market trying to buy corn acres away from beans now, or is fertilizer situation keeping more beans, a, more bean acres uh, than corn? Is that they're trying to keep more bean acres than corn? Um, so that's the first question. And then the second question is, do you think December 22 corn has a chance with U.S. weather this summer to run up to 8 to $10 or more per bushel? There's a lot going on with new crop uh, grains. I think some of the reason we've seen some anomalous increases in the new crop is because of the money problem that the commercials are currently under. Um, you know, you have a situation where there's only so much capital these commercial operators, you know, the banks are willing to, to extend them to put on short hedges when they uh, buy cash grain in from, from, from producers. We've already heard across a large swath of the Midwest that farmers really don't have no bid right now. They can't sell. No one's buying. And we think not only is that because I think a lot of grain has been bought and, and, and we have an oversupply of grain coming to the market, but we also think it's because the margin calls that these commercial operators have absorbed is so large that the banks are kind of balking at extending additional liquidity 
Because remember, if you buy new crop corn, you put a short edge on. That requires a margin uh, capability. You need to have the capital behind it, the credit behind it from your bank to pay the margin, you know, to keep the margin on the on the position. So I think a lot of the recent rise in new crop corn has nothing to do with trying to buy acres. I think it has everything to do with trying to reduce some of the margin exposure that these commercial operators have been under here over the last 30 to 45 days ever since this Russian thing took off. And, um, and so we have a liquidity problem. It's a liquidity problem in that there's just not enough liquidity for these commercial operators to continue to hedge until, you know, something starts to give back down and gets them out of some of these hedges or, um, or we just see the volatility start to calm down and, and the banks get more comfortable to lend this capital. So I don't really think this is a battle for acres situation going on. I think it's more of a you know, capital problem. It's a, it's a margin call problem more than anything else. I pretty much believe where the insurance premiums were set and where the current psychology is um, that I think, for, I mean, I think the planning intentions report is going to be larger than the market is expecting for corn acres and smaller than what the market is expecting for soybean acres um, from what I'm seeing. I think that that's what, that doesn't mean that's what's going to get planted, by the way, but that's, I think, what the USDA is going to say is that we're going to, you know, whatever the expectations are, I forget what they are, I think the market, the whatever is going to be higher um, on corn and less on soybeans based upon what I'm seeing today, where prices are, what I and where I think the, the you know the, the producer in the United States loves to plant corn if the price pencils out, um, and the price pencils out even with the higher fertilizer price it pencils out. And many of the farmers, I know, a good good portion of my customers already bought their fertilizer a year ago and are in fine shape. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it doesn't mean everyone did that. It doesn't mean somebody's not eating it. But overall, I think the corn acres will win out. But if we have a, 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 a difficult planting season, like we've been saying, I think we're going to have, it's delayed. There's a lot of uh, cold weather, a lot of snow potential. Uh, then we'll lose those, those corn acres. So the, the second part of that question, I think, was, you know, does corn, December corn futures have a shot at, what do you say, eight, nine? Eight to ten or more. Eight to ten. If we're going to see that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's going to have to be in this spring, early summer time frames. We think July, August weather looks really good. We're expecting much wetter conditions than last year in the dry areas. We're expecting cooler. It doesn't mean a cold summer, but last year was really, really hot. So we're looking at cooler weather and more moisture. Now, remember last year we produced uh, a, a good corn, uh, a, a decent corn crop and a really good soybean crop with hot and dry. If it's less hot, and less dry, you know, we should be able to produce an even bigger corn and soybean crop. So we're thinking it's going to be a bad start, strong finish. So if we're going to see that happen, we think it's going to be, you know, into June at the latest, uh, or it's not going to happen, you know, or, or not going to get that price spike. So um, our preferred pathway here is that we have a big break in the market heading into the planning intentions into early April. Everyone gets all bared up. Oh my gosh. You know, the way we're looking at it, Casey, you know, with all these high prices, we think the total planted acres for everything, rice, cotton, grains, we think we're just going to find a lot more acres getting planted or wanting to be planted. And that could add a, a bearish element to the market before Mother Nature kicks in and they start worrying about planting conditions not being ideal. So we think that the opportunity for a big setback here in the late March, early April is there, and then that could set the stage for a secondary blow-off top from the current blow-off top on geopolitical on weather. Uh, whether whether that's enough to, to make an 8 9 or $10 number, um, you know, obviously we'll just have to see how exactly weather plays out and exactly how this geopolitical... I mean, if the geopolitical all clears up by the spring and all this wheat actually is available to the marketplace it could it could change the complexion of what corn needs to do so it's unfortunately uh, Casey the geopolitical has complicated the forecast right now and it's very hard to gauge how that's going to play out right now but my our best guess is there's a shot at it but if there's going to be a shot at it, it's going to be early in the year not later so right on okay well Sean uh, 
thanks for answering that question. And uh, Brad, appreciate you sending the <coughs> sending the uh, email for the, with the question. If anybody else has a question they want to send, send it to uh, Moving Iron Podcast at movingironpodcast.com, and I'll make sure to ask Sean that question on, when next time I record. So, Sean, let's jump over and take a look at some of the volatility like you just talked about here a little bit. When you look at what's happening in the marketplace right now, there is a, uh, you know, wheat has just been on a upward tear here. I mean, in a in a limit up, I think they were limit up four days in a row, maybe, <clears throat> for like that before they started to have some down. Um, overnight, you've had, uh, you know, wheat has some volatility overnight, and um, it's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, you start looking at oil. Oil's on a straight up run here too. Um, yesterday, things kind of looked like there's some profit taking taking place, but also they they shot you know prices rebounded nicely by the end of by the close. So that interim uh inner day volatility starting to creep in and to me that's probably the most um interesting thing to watch throughout the day is is not necessarily what it opens and what it closes at in the day over day but what happens and during the day so talk about that a little bit and what you see happening there well think this through casey what is what, what, what is what is it that you just said you said that the market is now actually trading again <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So, yeah. so we went from we went from gap up, gap up, crude oil too, gap up, gap up, gap up. Get I me mean, one way right. trade, and now we're actually trading again. You know, crude went to one thirty, back down to one sixteen. So we're actually starting to trade again, and that's a transition. We're actually shifting now from a straight up move to now there's actually uh, some downside volatility. That's typically the transition from how I blow off top, begins to mature, loses its, its momentum until you start to develop some downside uh, momentum in the market. And what, that's usually news driven and something like this, you know, Casey, something will come out that eases the fears. You know, right now with where the wheat market is, we believe that the wheat market is trading, that there'll be no wheat supply coming out of the Ukraine for the next 12 months. Zero. We feel that the current price of wheat, for getting the money problem we talked about earlier in the program about commercials and margin calls and having to get out and doing all those, for getting the money problem, the price of wheat, in our view, is already factored in. No wheat supply coming out of the Ukraine for the next 12 months. Zero. Well, the only way, the only place to go from zero <laughs> it's straight up. is yeah. up. All right. Something more than zero. We do right. not believe it'll be a zero over the next two months. I don't know what the number will be, Casey, but I don't believe there'll be no supply coming out of Ukraine. I believe there'll be supplies coming out, and it could, actually could be surprisingly more than the market believes. There's a, over a billion bushels of wheat sitting in the field that will need to be harvested come June. Now, the market is anticipating that, that, the, that it'll just be left there to rot. Um, I don't believe the entire crop will be left there to rot. Maybe some of it will, but I don't believe that it's in anyone's interest to let good wheat sitting there that's harvestable not get harvested. I think there'll be a way to find a way to come to some uh, calmer times to allow the wheat crop to be harvested. Um, I just feel that if, you, if you're Russia, you want that wheat supply, you need that wheat supply, and you're going to get that wheat supply somehow, some way, and you're going to make the conditions available that you get it. It's a long time from now. In geopolitical time, Casey, you know, from early March to, to June harvest, I mean, it's a long time. Right. Uh, I, I just feel some planters, are, I mean, some harvesters are going to be rolling and in, in, in harvesting that wheat. Um, and so all the, so, 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 and, and, and is, is all that wheat going to actually be you know, not sold? I mean, the, Russia needs money. Uh, you know, Ukraine needs money. I mean, the, the system needs money. So I, I think that the zero number is being overly, overly worst case scenario. And we're going to get something less than zero. And that's how you get a big down in the wheat market. And that's how you kind of get this correction. I think we're going to get here into late March, early April. Then people are worrying about, oh, my gosh, we're going to plant all these acres in the U.S. Oh, my gosh, look at all these extra acres. Now Europe is going to plant. You know, we, we, we've done the job of telling the world, you know, I think the USDA is going to count acres on Mars. <laughs> yeah, I think, that, we're, I, I, I think there's going to be two, yeah. two, million, two million wheat acres planted on Mars that actually can produce a yield this year. I'm just I'm kidding, but you know what I'm saying. I 
right? <laughs> when you're when you're trading zero supply, that's a really, really hard number to maintain. And I just don't think that the thing is situation is that dire. I might be wrong, but I think we're going to find out that some of those supplies are going to be harvested and available. And yes, the corn crop will get planted in some fashion as well. And that the zero number is not going to be the, the right number and we're going to have to recover. Now. So the fact that the market is starting to trade now means that the market is starting to worry a little bit that maybe we've priced it all in. Does it mean it, it, you know today's the top? Does it mean we can't go higher? But it's saying that the market is now starting to question whether we've got high enough. And that's the first sign of losing a blow-off top momentum. So on that same topic, when you look at, at wheat coming out of Russia, right? So there's going to be that, all that issue there. Uh, I mean, is the market looking at that from a, de a delay standpoint of getting that out as well just because of, of what the issue is with the Black Sea? Well, Russia could get its wheat out. It doesn't have to go through Ukraine ports to get the Russia wheat out. It can go out through other, right. go out through, you know, it, it, everyone thinks that, you know, it's all Russia we're talking about. No, we're talking about Ukraine wheat. The Ukraine grown wheat needs to go out of the ports mm -hmm. pretty much. Um, but the Russian wheat does not have to go out of the ports. It can go out of other ports. It can go, well, you know, by, uh, by land. And it is going by land in a lot of cases to a lot of places. Um, now, the market is saying that Russia, you know, remember Russia was already constricting these exports with high export taxes. You know, maybe they knew they were going to do this. And so they were keeping more wheat on hand. Maybe that was their game plan all along, right? Right. But, but, uh, so it doesn't. So the market's betting that the Russia is going to purposely continue to withhold their wheat supplies from the market into perpetuity. I don't think that's the case either. I mean, from what I, from the news that I see, it looks like several months before this invasion, they worked out a deal with China to sell China all kinds of wheat that they need. So I believe it, the wheat will be very available to certain people. Not necessarily available to everyone, but it will be available to certain people. So if you supply the Chinese with all the wheat they need from Russia, then they don't need to buy wheat from anybody else. Well, then that, leave, then that eases that supply that they would have bought, and those supplies now go to somebody else. So, so I, I think the market is overreacting that, no, those supplies are going to be available to China and maybe some in the Middle East that are friendly to Russia, that sort of thing. And that, so that, that's not no supply available. It just means selective supply available, but it does ease the burden of overall supply and demand of what is currently being priced in. So I think, once again, pretty significant overreaction here right now. Okay. All right, so now I've read two articles so far this morning um, about uh, the ban of uh, Congress rallied last night, banned, or talking about banning anyway. They haven't done anything yet. Banning the... Uh, import of uh, Russian oil uh, to the U.S. What's that going to do to the overall uh, oil market as you as you take, I mean, as, as things kind of unround? We're already, you know, Brent crude is, you know, 120 plus dollars a barrel. WTI is kind of the same range. I mean, I guess, so as you look at that now, what is that going to do to the oil, overall oil supply? Well, if you're, the spike trade yesterday, Casey, when right. it opened up at 131 or something like that, was mm -hmm. on the news that we're not going to buy Russian oil. Right. Well, they're going to sell the oil. <laughs> <laughs> Just not right. to us. Just not to us, okay? right. Yep. So, so once again, uh, that, that doesn't mean that the oil isn't available. Does it mean that the oil isn't being entering the global supply demand equation? It will go to China. It will go to other people who need it. It will go to India. You know, it'll, it will find its place elsewhere. So those markets that would normally buy crude oil from other people and are instead going to get more of it from Russia than they used to means that the supplies they would have bought from others now is available to the marketplace, to others. You, you follow? Like, right. it, 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 it's, it's all connected. So I, people are trying to create this one-dimensional, it's black and it's white. Well, not really. They're saying, well, the supply now is not available. Of course it's available, just not available to the United States if we do this. We'll just get our oil from elsewhere. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to pay the same, that we won't pay a higher price for a little while. Maybe we will. But remember, Casey, uh, the U.S. is going to increase production. Now, it's that you just don't snap your fingers and increase production right away. Right. It might take six months. But later in the year, I don't care who these 
you know, who, what the U.S. producers think or don't think about the Biden administration, what their long-term plans are, if they can lock in a very, very profitable price, um, then they're going to that they're in the business of being of running profitable uh, operations, and so they're going to go out there and start getting those fracking rings uh, rigs going again and getting some more production. You know, doesn't mean they're going to go out and spend a ton of money on all of new oil fields, but there's a lot of oil fields they abandoned when the market went, went to minus thirty five. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. That, that yeah. they can go back. They, they yeah. can go back to and with not an exorbitant amount of capital, get them up and running again at least. And that will ease the burden as well. So I think that, once again, you know, I, I think ultimately that's a good thing if we get more production growing in the country. That means we'll be less dependent on, on Russia a year from now. And overall, I, you know, I'm not here to say that what Biden is, uh, the administration is suggesting is good or bad or indifferent. Okay? I ultimately believe that government, government intervention in general is a bad idea most of the time. Okay? But if they are going to do it, I don't think that increasing our domestic production of crude oil is a bad thing. I actually think it would be a good thing for insulating ourselves to future energy shocks if we actually got our own production going again from these high prices. But it will take time, um, and obviously the market is still anticipating you know, kind of a squeeze here. But I often think that sometimes those kinds of news stories that was, oh my, you know, Oh my gosh, news stories like we got where you had that, what was it, a $10, $15 spike in the opening trade that, right. uh, last night. Sometimes those put in the tops. Mm-hmm. Sometimes. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not here predicting a top and a blow off top, but sometimes that's how you make the blow off top when, when it's so bullish you can't imagine it ever coming down again. Maybe that was the blow off top high for curl on this go around. It's possible. Yep. It's very possible. Yep. Yeah. Million moving parts here, Sean. Um, you know, but also let's let's uh, let's also remind everybody: if you look out on the production curve, I mean on the uh, price curve. So if you look out, you know, twelve to eighteen months from now, crude oil is, is between eighty-five and nine dollars a barrel. Mm-hmm. So what's the real price of crude? Is it one hundred and twenty, or is it eighty-five to ninety? What is the real price of crude? You know, what is the long-term price of crude? Where everyone's all dealing with the short-term pinch we're dealing with. You know, is that the real price of crude? I mean, of course, you're paying it now, so it's real to those who are paying it. But the, but the long-term cost situation of crude is really not what it is today. It's what it is over the next five years. Is, is, are we going to average 120 bars of oil over the next five years? Maybe we will, but probably not. Probably we're going to average something less, and I think that the futures curve is telling you that between demand destruction that these high oil energy prices cause and increased future production, they're telling you what the real price of oil is in this environment is more like 85 to 90, which actually fits better with the overall supply-demand equation and the cost of production here in the United States. So I think we have to we have to understand where, where the the nature of a near-term supply pinch and the long-term price of crude oil. Okay, one more question about oil, and I, I, I kind of understand why they're doing this, but the U.S. is considering lifting sanctions so Venezuela can get its oil flowing again. Now, obviously, that is, uh, hey, you know what, we're going to get rid of this Russian oil, we're going to get some Venezuela oil and, and call it, and that way we can kind of offset this a little bit. I mean, we're going we're gonna to start importing all this oil in when we could just get our own oil, but that's, that's a whole other topic. But I guess, is that... <clears throat> Is that a political move, in your in your opinion, to, to offset some of the pressure that we see happening in in with the Russian oil ban? Look, I, I, I'm not a uh, I'm not a uh, PhD geopolitical uh, strategist, um, but it, you know, in the game of chess, um, if I'm thinking this through, uh, I think the Biden administration and those who are advising him are trying to create the image that we don't need the Russian oil. That we have access to other oil. We have access to Venezuela oil. We have, it looks like we're trying to work out an arrangement with Iran to get the Iran oil flowing back to us again and, and rekindle the Iran deal that President Trump um, took back. We're mm-hmm. trying to get that going in. There's negotiations to get that oil flowing again. I think they're trying to create the impression that, you know, we have other access to oil. On top of it, we're going to produce our own oil. Uh, we really don't need you. So if you think that's going to work to deter us from what we're doing, uh, nice try. 
I think that's probably what they're trying to do, Casey, you know, that there is some political uh, posturing here. Remember, Venezuela has not made investments in its crude oil <laughs> industry in quite a long time. Right. Yeah. Um, so if, 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 if they got back to investing in it again, we probably wouldn't see a material impact to seeing it, uh, imports from crude oil from Venezuela being meaningful for probably at least 12 to 18 months. But it's still, but, but it, once again, it's trying to tell the Russians, you know, you can try to do this, but we really do have other places to go. And in, in, in another year, we're not going to need you anyway. So clearly there's a lot of posturing going on on both sides. What's actually going on behind the scenes, not you, neither you or I really know, other than clearly this is a chess match, and you know we'll have to see who actually gets checkmated here. Yeah. So. Yeah. Speaking of getting checkmated, um, <laughs> 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 it's funny. I just and this we don't, we don't really need to dive into this, but it's just the funny the articles that you read, right? You know, so China gets a hold of of uh, Marcon in uh, France and. Uh, Oh, the fellow over there in uh, Germany. Oh, what's your name? Uh, oh, Schultz. Uh, and they, he wants to sit down and have a, you know, we should all get together and have peace talks with, and calm this whole thing down. And the very next very next article below that is China favors Russia, censors Ukraine. So <laughs> it's just, it's the most it's the most outlandish stuff. You couldn't make this stuff up and if, you, if you even tried. So China's trying to play both sides of the fence here to keep... Uh, as much face as they can. I mean, they openly supported Russia and the, and the Ukraine thing, and that backfired on them. So now they're trying to, hey, we didn't really mean it, you know. Well, look, I mean, <clears throat> uh, for better or for worse, Russia and China are uh, believe that they have a self-interest to work together here to go against the West. Yeah. Um, and that's what they're doing. So it's it, you know used in the in the Cold War it was U.S. against Russia, and now it's going to be U.S. and Europe against Russia and China now. Um, and and that that that's the line drawn. The, it's a, it's a new geopolitical reality, mm -hmm. and um, and and that's that's what's going on here. And and how this all plays out and what the new rules are, um, we'll have to wait and see. Obviously, we're in the process of re. Uh, setting up these relationships and how this is all going to work, but but in the end, um, you know, China does not want high food and energy prices, and they know uh, they still need the U.S. for a lot of their food imports. So they have to toe a very delicate line. They don't. They need Russia. They want Russia on their side. Uh, at the same time, you know they. They, they do need to have an olive branch out to the West um, to, you know, just be, that just be very, very careful. So I think that's why you're seeing what you just said. You know, hey, peace talks and, you know, we're really, we're, we're with you. Right. You know? um, and, uh, and just, and, and, and on top of it, you know, take a look what happened with the nickel market. I don't know if you've been following it, but they, the London Metals Exchange literally shut the market down because it was up like 250% overnight on a massive commercial short squeeze, like we talked about what's going on in the wheat mm -hmm. market, in the grain markets where these commercial operators have margin calls that the banks are, are kind of squirmishing, wanting to fund. We had a situation where um, massive, massive commercial liquidation, 250% increase in price. They shut the market down. They're trying to determine who owes what. They think that it might be a default of the nickels exchange. Um, they're 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 actually thinking of canceling all the trades that occurred um, on that 250 percent increase to try to get people to pay. So 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 everyone really has to be careful that there's a fundamental side to this, but there's a there's a big big money side to this, and a lot of movements are happening um, in markets that are being driven by the money monster, not the actual fundamentals. And so I'd be very very careful of reading too much in. To some of these prices, saying it means this, it means that. Just be aware that we're in a very wild, a very chaotic time right now, where money's flying off the handle uh, all over the place. And that if you are a farmer, if you're an end user, if you're somebody involved in these ag markets, be very mindful of your risk on any hedges you're putting on, on anything that you're doing. Be very mindful of, of your risk reward and, and don't get yourself caught in a situation. You know, we would really, 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 really uh, promote the idea of using, you know, 
options strategies as a cash producer, as a as a as a farmer, um, than than using future strategies at this moment in time because we think that's a way you can manage the risk. Um, and even if you get caught in a two hundred fifty percent increase in the wheat market overnight, should that occur, um, you know you're not going to be taken out to the woodshed and and, ha- and lose your farm. Just be very mindful of that. Yeah. So. Good answer there, Sean. All right, man. Folks want to reach out to you, get more information about what it is that you're doing over at Hackett Financial. What's the best way to do that? Our website is Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors.com. Lots of information on that goes over what we do with smart money, with our natural climate cycle algorithm to see if what we do could be of value to your listeners. Right on. Sean, appreciate you being on the podcast, man. Thanks, Casey. Always glad to be here. Thursday, let's talk about ethanol and see what, how, that, how that all comes together. <laughs> And renewable diesel, because yep. there's a lot of talk about removing these these mandates for a little while. So yep. good, I think it's a good idea. Okay, right on. So tune in Thursday for all the, your renewable fuels talk with Sean Hackett and Casey Seymour. All right. <clears throat> so with that, I'm Casey Seymour. Uh, find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, that's where you find the latest edition of the Moving Iron Podcast. Go to Moving Iron LLC for the entire library of the Moving Iron Podcast, as well as every blog I have written is up there on my on the website as well. Also, uh, all the information for the Moving Iron Summit is coming up in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, that will be September 6th, 7th, and 8th uh, at uh, Hilton Downtown uh, there in Nashville. So if you're interested in checking that out, uh, go to the website, see the speakers, what have you. If you have any other questions, send me an email at uh, movingironsummit.info at, uh, let's see, pretty sure that's right. Before I better check that real quick to make sure. Oh, yeah, movingiron.summit at movingironllc.com and you can get all the information that way so send me that email and I will get back to you so with that I'm Casey Seymour with Sean Hackett let's move some iron folks out Axon Tire is going to have more tips tricks and client advice throughout the year and in September at the Moving Iron Summit in Nashville if you're looking to sign up for the event please head over to movingironllc.com we hope to see you there Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransitinc.com for all of your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. In the 21st century Hard-working people Working hard for you and me Moving higher Time and time again Through the years you'll find us here